Just two days until ballots are due, and the top three contenders in the race for Portland mayor in campaign overdrive this afternoon. Strange trial starts tomorrow, pitting two actors against one another, and it's all over the BP oil spill. He's out of jail, Jeff, but he wasn't around to answer our questions on camera this afternoon. New at 11, a Northwest hero earns one of the nation's highest military honors for saving the lives of his fellow soldiers in Afghanistan. Tonight, that would-be robber in jail, the convenience store owner, calling the Good Samaritans his superheroes. Everything going on. Now, we know this envelope was found around 4.30. Hazmat team came, but just a few minutes ago, you gave the all clear. What happened? Police have identified a 10-year-old autistic boy found alone on a MAX train in Northeast Portland on Friday evening, and they're still looking for his family. This is the Gresham Gator. Although he looked a lot bigger than this on TV, he's actually only about four and a half feet long. They have been standing in the exact same spot. I'll say maybe they've moved a, about a foot in the last three hours toward the protesters, but nobody's really moving toward each other. First, it was Clackamas County fighting the light rail. Now four other cities have joined the battle. Police say the gun turned out not to be a firearm, but a pellet gun. And many neighbors we've talked to here say they're shocked that it happened right in their neighborhood. And I'm Casey Montoya. Now the snow, it's hit or miss right now. We want to thank you for all of your pictures and help covering this tonight. Problems mounting for one of the world's biggest brokers. At least three executives at J.P. Morgan Chase are reportedly on their way out. It was a gorgeous day. I hope you got a chance to enjoy some of it. But if not, Sally Showman tells us there's more of that to come. Well, you can hear and see parents and students rallying right here outside of where negotiations are going on. As crews are staying here, stocking up, waiting for this storm to pass, and many still shaken up after finding out four of their own are presumably dead. Don't look now, but Oregon's next major business hub could be in central Oregon. Apple paid more than $5 million for 160 acres of land in Prineville. It's not far from the data center recently built by Facebook. This deal means hundreds of construction jobs for the county and more people hired to staff the data center when it's finished. Another data center called Jasper is also in the works, but it's unknown who's behind that project. New at six, state police arrest a man in the Dalles, too drunk to drive, so his 10-year-old son was at the wheel. Officers say they noticed a car swerving with its hazard lights on. Police say Jose Torres was steering the car from the passenger seat while his son was controlling the pedals. After finding an open container of alcohol, Torres was arrested and charged with DUI, reckless driving, recklessly endangering another person, and not having a valid driver's license. The boy is home with his mother tonight. The five men who allegedly planned the September 11th terror attacks refused to answer judges' questions and did not enter pleas during their arraignment Saturday. They're charged with the murder of each person who died in the 9-11 attacks. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the man who claims to have orchestrated the attacks, did all he could to disrupt court. He and his four co-conspirators refused to answer the judge's questions, read magazines, prayed, and would not listen to Arabic translations. Their lawyer says their silence is their way to fight back. The accused refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the military commissions as demonstrated through their silence. These men have endured year, years of inhumane treatment and torture. None of the defendants entered a plea at the hearing. Each faces the death penalty if found guilty. Now this trial, it's expected to take years to complete. New at six, for the first time in about 20 years, France will be run by a socialist government. Francois Hollande has defeated current president Nicolas Sarkozy in today's runoff election. In his victory speech, he promised to be a president for all of France, becoming the nation's first left-wing president since 1995. Sarkozy has led France since 2007. Well, thousands of people taking advantage of this weekend's improving weather to head to the Cinco de Mayo Festival at Waterfront Park. And so many were there, a Guinness World Record may have been broken. More than a thousand people put on sombreros during yesterday's activities, and that easily beats the record for the number of people wearing sombreros at the same time. The old record to beat was 500. It's been nearly two years since Kyron Horman disappeared, but his father says he's not giving up hope. Kane Horman was at Portland's largest garage sale today at the Expo Center, passing out flyers and buttons with Kyron's picture on them. Horman says he's still optimistic Kyron is out there.
until they give us a reason not to be. And I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting that he's out there, that he's watching, and hopefully he has the opportunity to see that we're still out doing everything that we're doing for him. And uh, I hope it gives him a little bit of hope that you know we're not we're not giving up. Foreman says there are still a lot of people working on the case, and he wants everyone to continue to look for his son. The man who killed Trayvon Martin is still in jail tonight, and his attorney says it will be a few more days before he gets released. Bond for George Zimmerman is set at $150,000. His attorney admits it's been a tough process coming up with the bail money. Meantime, tensions are still high in Florida. Terry Jones, he's a pastor who gained notoriety for burning a Quran. He led a small group of demonstrators supporting Zimmerman. In the end, no matter whose side people are on, those living in Sanford, Florida, say they just want this to end. Casey, the suspect is back home today. He is. He's out of jail, Jeff, but he wasn't around to answer our questions on camera this afternoon. And we just talked to seven-year-old Angel Martinez and the two other little boys that were with him yesterday afternoon. They say they were taking a shortcut home, but Angel's mom says when she came here to pick him up from the bus stop and he wasn't here, she knew something was wrong. There's this guy that pointed a gun and he let a dog go and it was chasing me. Avelia Vasquez says her seven-year-old son Angel got off his school bus at the wrong stop Tuesday afternoon with two nine-year-old boys. When they tried to take a shortcut home through this gravel driveway, Angel says 67-year-old Norman Van Dyke came out with his dog waving a 22 caliber gun. The other kid said, oh, he was chasing me first, then he chased Angel, and but they ran. They went out of there. When they say they're gone and the dog, they ran. The boys ran to a neighbor's house to call police. When Angel's parents confronted Van Dyke, he admitted to waving the gun. He said, oh yeah, I did, but the gun wasn't loaded. Vasquez says Van Dyke didn't seem to care the kids were so young. He say, oh, it's because I'm tired of the Mexicans come through here, leave trash and everything. I don't care. I said, I don't care about the other people. I care about my son. And you put a gun on him and you chase and you leave the dog chase to chase the, the three little kids. Forest Grove police arrested Van Dyke, charging him with three counts of menacing. Vasquez says she knows her son made a mistake, but that's no excuse for pointing a gun at children. Like yesterday I was going to sleep, but I like I couldn't dream like I couldn't sleep because I was thinking what what happened. Those three little boys say they're still pretty scared today. Now, Van Dyke was released late last night. I spoke to him on the phone this afternoon. He was very polite. He said he's tired of people ignoring those trespassing signs, and he thinks the same groups of people keep walking through his yard. He tells me that it happens about 100 times every year. The group Christians United for Israel, they're planning a big event tonight on campus. They have a terrorism expert coming to speak, so they've been putting up these flyers on campus. Well, tonight's event is getting a lot of attention, but not because of who's coming to speak. It's because of what was drawn on one of these. It's scary for Jewish students. Amy Albertson proudly wears her Star of David necklace, even though she feels threatened lately by what she calls anti-Semitic behavior on campus. It's scary to see swastikas anywhere, whether it's on the wall or, you know, especially on a pro-Israel event flyer. The flyers like this one have been disappearing from community billboards in recent days, but that's not why these students are upset. Someone defaced one of these by drawing a swastika inside the Star of David. A swastika in the middle of the Star of David is it's an act of hate speech, so it's it's the same as, as a burning cross in, in an African-American's yard or something like that. Brittany McKay found the flyer a few days ago. I'm not part of the group and I didn't um, organize this event, but I found this poster and it really disturbed me, so I reported it to the university. She says there's more hate speech than this on campus. This is the proof they've managed to save, but the students in Christians United for Israel don't want to see anyone get in trouble over this. They want an open conversation. We hope that the people that that uh, deface the posters or don't feel comfortable with this, we hope they come because we, we want them to meet us and show them that we're nice people, we care about them, and we care about having an elevated discussion on campus. 
A PSU spokesman tells us this is the only incident reported to them, but students, they want more. They want campus officials to come out with a statement saying this kind of behavior will not be tolerated on campus. Meantime, the event here tonight will go on at 730 and they are also expecting some protesters. He's in limbo. He says he's waiting day by day to see what happens, especially since he's already waived all his appeals. Haugen tells me that he's the most upset his family and friends and victims family and friends are suffering and going on a wild ride of emotions. He's a very handsome man. It's hard to believe she's describing a twice convicted murderer. And he has a heart of gold though, you know. Barbara Ariano shows me photos of Gary Haugen from inside prison. A lifelong friend of Haugen's, she was prepared for him to die today. I've been thinking about it all day going, oh, this is the day it was supposed to happen. Ariano has been on an emotional roller coaster as Haugen has been making his way through the Oregon justice system on his mission to die. When that will happen is unknown. Governor Kitzhaber issued a moratorium on all executions while he's in office, putting Haugen in a state of limbo. Let's talk about um, the, uh, the anxiety and the uh, cruel and unusual punishment, you know, that is um, bestowed to, to uh, you know, all involved in relation to it, especially my family. Now my family's just, they're just so emotionally um, just shredded. I spoke to Haugen's sister, Rita Marie, via Skype this afternoon. She says this process has been very painful. I'm happy because my brother is still alive. I'm sad because, you know, how could the governor do this to our family twice? You know, this is the second time I had to prepare for my brother's death and it didn't happen. And that's very emotionally draining. The families of Haugen's victims are feeling the same pain. Clorinda Poland Perez's husband, David Poland, was killed by Haugen in prison eight years ago. It's a, an incredible injustice. It, it is injustice. I feel that he has victimized us all over again. From death row, Haugen says he agrees with Governor Kitzhaber. Our criminal justice system is broken, but questions the timing of calling off his execution. He can call it, you know, conscious, you know, he found his conscious. Uh, where, uh, you know, under more and right? You know, I mean, let's be real. You know, he talks about more and right. Oh, I really struggled, you know, with the uh, with the execution. And well, which one? Because you hit, uh, you hit two back to back in in two years, and, I, and it really didn't seem like any kind of a struggle at all. Haugen wants to get more legal advice and see what his options are for the future, but he'll most likely remain on death row for at least the next few years, and says he still wants to die.